My name is Thomas Heilsberg, and I've been with Simcorp, so the current company, for a year, uh, doing the three-tier transform transformation from a two-tier and later to the cloud. And the interesting thing here is I've done this before, uh, because of, before I was with Simcorp, I've been with Microsoft for 15 years as the CTO and chief architect of what today is known as uh, Business Central, one of the ERP products. And you can see from the pictures here that we transitioned that from an old two-tier.exe connecting to a database and other uh, clients connected to the same database and thereby forming a typical two-tier solution. Um, we re-architected that into becoming you know, three-tier and eventually a software as a service on the cloud scalable to more than a million users because we had to ship this as part of the Office 365 in, in some cases. Now, SimCorp is an interesting company. Uh, you could ask, why did I move from, from Microsoft to SimCorp? And, and the reason is because basically I got the chance to do it all over once more. I find this challenge extremely interesting. I had absolutely no idea what SimCorp was a company. Uh, basically, do SimCorp do SIM cards or something like that? I had no idea. Um, the interesting thing is, uh, SimCorp, we do asset management, basically a big pension fund, national banks, and stuff like that. They have you know tons of stocks, bonds, uh, credit swaps, and all those instruments and software to govern that is exactly what Simco is doing, risk analysis and so forth. And there's an interesting list here of some of our clients, which are, are some of the absolute biggest ones in the world. Actually, we have 52% of the top 50 biggest asset managers in the world in our client portfolio. An interesting thing here is you look at Norway's bank or the National Bank of Norway, they have a ton of oil up there. They're managing all those investments they do with that oil money in our software and the current value as of yesterday evening was, and I can't even say that number. But the interesting thing for, for technical people and developers is if you count the number of digits in that number, you are actually at the number of digits that a 64 or double precision floating point variable can hold. So we are facing a huge problem there when the first digit there turns into you know, uh, nine and then uh, beyond. And, and uh, obviously we are looking at that. Simcop has 650 developers uh, worldwide, uh, and, and that's a huge organization. And one of the things that the split session is also going to be is how you select members for teams in such a huge organization and so forth. So the challenge was this. Here you have the, the current, you could call it legacy, but the current software um, as it is right now. So you have a first tier is a database, second tier is a, an application that could run on a client and you just access the database, or you have a third tier introduced by Citrix, which is basically a remote, the screens and the keystrokes uh, back and forth, thereby providing a security layer between tier two and tier three. Um, you could say, what's wrong with this model? And essentially, nothing is wrong with this model if you're only a single user, because then it's looked like this, and, and any three-tier solution would, wouldn't be that different. But the point is, if you start scaling this to multiple users, you start seeing the trouble, because each of these users needs to have their own machine, so to speak. So if you have, as in this case, 21 users, well, you need 21 VMs, each one VM for one user in there. And that's a horrible use of hardware, horrible use of uh, cloud infrastructure if you're moving to the cloud, and that's exactly uh, the challenge we are facing to make this into something that is smarter. Again, if you want to do a web service into such a system, you will face the same problem again, because you need to have a pool of machines that can take those requests. And actually, one of our, our clients you know, have more than 350 VMs standing by to take these web service requests or other kinds of requests coming in, which obviously is not optimal, or far from optimal at least. So the challenge is basically to, to make this into something smarter. Obviously, if you want to do a three-tier service, you just fire it up, you have multiple sessions, possibly multiple tenant, multi, multi, multi on every dimension. But here's the trouble. The real life we are facing is we have a, uh, an application out there with 35 years of intellectual property built into it. And that's actually there's a small spin-off here. I had a meeting with, with um, one of the major banks here in Europe, and they, they, they told me that they set aside 20% of their development budget to refactor old code. And their rate of doing that is just about 3% a year. 
And think about that for a second, because that basically means it'll take them just about 30 years to refactor their current code. And that's a huge challenge, because obviously when they reach 15, the code they refactored is now old again. And that leads to a situation where they need to allocate something like 40 to 60% of all their developers just constantly refactoring, without doing any new features. And that's a horrible situation to be in, and that's why you need to constantly invest in bringing down technical depth and renewing your code. The thing we're facing here is 4,000 forms, uh, a single user software that is um, built upon the principle, I have the entire machine. So there's only one thread executing, or it could be possibly multi-threaded in calculation scenarios, but there's only one flow executing, one context, so to speak. Um, and that makes it, makes it very hard. UI logic, business logic, totally entangled, because there was at that point no reason to do it differently. And that's, a, that's the entire thing here. It's not because this software is bad. Not at all, actually. It's pretty smart uh, at, at several places. But it was done according to a different rule book. So it, you could say the rule book has changed, and that is basically the challenge. How do you change the rule book from underneath, so to speak? So, my favorite approach, obviously, very simple. You stop the world, then you refactor the crap out of the entire thing, and 10 years later, you restart the world again. Uh, the problem is, all the software projects I've been into so far, that has never, ever been possible. Even if it were possible, you would be facing something with 10 years of refactoring code, and then, boom, big bang, now it's there. The new version, super duper, and so forth. It's never going to happen, and no company with their right mind would ever allow such a strategy. So what you end up with instead is some requirements. You need to keep developing features. We ship software every three months right now, and we're on our path to continuous delivery in cloud and so forth. You need to constantly ship. You need to constantly make money. Obviously, money makes the world go around. That's no different from us. So we need to be able to develop features, sell to customers and so forth while we are doing these refactoring projects. And that means that it's all about agility. So obviously, we are doing agile development like, like most of us today. And that was a transformation that was done a couple of years back. And then we need to do it incremental. So how do you change such a legacy thing incrementally into uh, a three-tier solution? And that's basically um, the challenge. And then, of course, when are you done? That's the constant question I get from the board of directors. And you know, kind of go, well. <laughs> Interesting, and how do you answer such a question? And, and, and Nils will look into how we break down um, the problem here. So what is the strategy? And I call it the first one, find bolt number two. And that leads me to talk something a little bit different about bolt number two. There's a human thing here which is interesting. Imagine yourself on a car, you suddenly get a flat tire, and you, know, you put it up on a jack to replace the, the wheel. Bolt number one is fine. Bolt number two, mm, it's completely stuck. And you, mm, mm, mm. You spend 10 seconds on it. And here comes the interesting thing about human mind. Then you move on to bolt number three. Why? Why do we do that as humans? Right? Because we have an interest in seeing progress. We really think that getting bolt number three and later bolt number four, go back to number two, it's still stuck. And then we do bolt number five. Right? And then what? <laughs> we still haven't achieved anything. And that my life philosophy when looking at bit projects is always find bolt number two and fix that one first, or at least make the plan, make it feasible that you can solve that problem. Don't even look at bolt number one. Everybody can fill in and fix bolt number one at every given time. That's a you know, small sand you can pour into to a plan, but you need to have a plan and a whiteboard drawing of what you're going to do about bolt number two. And that's for the next thing, draw the entire solution. That's important you do that. Prove that you can solve this bolt number two thing. And then build the solution on today's concepts, obviously. And then comes the lift and shift. I'm a strong believer in lift and shift. As I said, I've done it before. And what that is all about is when you have the new foundation built up, then you lift the existing thing onto it. It's still single user. It's still working. It doesn't work any smarter by being lifted onto the new foundation. But it gives you the ability to iterative attack the problems one by one. And that's what we, what we are doing here. 
And then you need to watch out for the we could also. Because that's a big trap of the black hole of extra work doing the lift project. If you go into, now we are at it, let's also, then it's going to be one of those 10-year never-ending projects. It requires a ton of discipline to stay away from refactorings, which is not absolutely necessary to make it work. So the entire transformation is basically from this red thing here on the, on the left side, um, which is a single user, single workspace. We have a programming language, APL, which uh, all this software is all about, you know, 45 years old for the, for the first pieces and so forth. And we want to turn that into the, quote, blue world, which essentially is a three-tier application, multi-session, multi-whatever, by this lift and shift. And Nils will talk a little bit more about the details on how we're doing that. Here you go. Thank you very much, Thomas. So... Uh, I'm Nils, I've been in Simco for 10 years, and I, I think that um, being part of such a project where we basically look at the value we have in our code and modernize it into a 3 tree architecture is, is probably some, something of the most exciting thing I've done, been part of, and getting guidance from somebody that have actually done it before, of course, also makes it something that you believe in. So if you try to double click a little bit on, on, on the architecture here, so high level. So when Thomas says about bolt number two and, and talk about what are the, the main in the obstacles that we need to get right first, then uh, the architecture here shows what we are dealing with. So first of all, we have what's called the unified platform. It's the bottom part. It's, it's the piece of software that we do from scratch is where we want to build it on modern principles and we want it to behave like when, when you have a request coming from the outside from a client, then it can scale, it can take that request and it can spawn it off and then engage all these million slides of, of old code we have. So this foundation, which we call unified platform, is very much about scaling outside in. It's about sharing data. So we are in a world now where, where we need to do also look at the eco economics. So building the ability to share uh, and all of this in process communication. Uh, so we are talking about one, one single process here. So that's some of the more groundbreaking things. We also need to figure out how do we build applications going forward? What's the new application model? And here we, we one, one thing is looking at at entirely new, uh, new application, new software, so new C Sharp applications in our case, but also about the existing applications, whether they are written in C Sharp or APL and other program languages that we use. So all these, whether it's from the old or the new, we go into this same application model. So all this is, is going into, you can say, where we start from, from the scratch. If we look at the uh, refactoring, so having a, a platform that has some core capabilities, what are we then looking at? More than 2 million lines of C-sharp code that has been built as a, a, with globals and statics and all that. And now we need to make that into a shape where you can actually run more sessions, that you can have all this multi-session and concurrent uh, sessions. So that's refactoring. We need to separate UI logic from business code and so forth. We need to categorize data. So what data goes into being session-specific or user-specific and tenant-specific and so all that. But it's something you can do. If you structured work with this, you can actually go through your, our code in our case. And we also need to look at the existing frameworks and figure out how we can scrape the UI uh, layout and the data bindings and commands and all that because we need to separate this. So that's one of the, the tasks. Then basically we have the same task for APL. Um, one thing is that when we looked at the millions of lines of APL code we have, then we say, well, it's not really doable to go through and, and make it uh, session specific. So, so isolating all the globals and make instances when a session comes in. That's just a too big task for this. So we need to find the scalability in different ways. But it's also uh, part of, of the APL uh, language is that it's an interpreter language and the interpreter is written in, in C. So it's native code. So now we also have an architecture that blends in the managed heap from .NET and then a different kind of managed heap in, in the APL world. They have a garbage collecting, it's just reference counting instead of uh, stop and copy and, and mark and sweep and so forth. But there is something very different aspect semantically about APL being that arrays are, for instance, uh, immutable data types. 
right? So, so also having the idea to say that can we take the and uh, code like APL and transform it into, let's say, C sharp, then you get into these troubles about very fundamental differences in the programming languages semantics. So, so that is not doable either. So what we have chosen to do is to say, okay, we will maybe not scale this to, let's say, 1,000 user sessions in one play server, but we can maybe get, get 50 or 100 or, or 30 by actually uh, having uh, uh, parallel APL interpreters running so that we can have the code that is not written for multi uh, sessions, having it running in their own interpreted space, what I call here in, uh, interpretation sessions, having multiple of those running next to each other, and then again, the problem of sharing. If we can share, then that can actually be a doable way of doing it. And that is also part of bolt number two, that we actually know this is possible. So here we have an architecture where we don't have to refactor close to the impossible of, of a lot of APL code. So we create the, the uh, multiple sessions a little bit differently. Um, that leads on to, you can say, how, how do you split such work in, in an organization? And I've just written 30 teams here. It could also be 40 or 50 teams. The point is that we have a lot of technical refactoring. We have to build new and so forth. How do you actually do that? And what we have done, and, and that basically also goes into the competences, the, the, the technical competences needed here, that basically everyone is needed. So for the unified platform, so, so building that is something you can do in isolation. You know exactly what capabilities you want to start with, so that you can spawn off. As soon as possible, when the, the core bricks have been put down, then we can talk about adding the existing code, millions of lines of code on top of that. Um, we need to go into the existing code and figuring out how can we actually uh, create the, the APIs to the client. How can we, hopefully from a framework point of view and that we know we can do, actually separate the UI uh, layouts and, and, and the bindings and, and so forth. We have to build and use then client. That's something we can, we can spawn off in parallel. Um, transport layers, there's a lot of effort going into that and, and packages and te telemetry and performance measurements and chattiness and all that goes into that bucket. And then for the lots of millions of lines of code, then you can also go in and say what are the, the properties, the technical properties you want in that code in order to, be, to make it liftable in order to you know, separate the code from the business layer, to, to figure out what data you can share, and, and all that stuff. So all this can be split in. So given you are a, a big organization, you have the teams available, you can actually go in and, and split this work up. And obviously, we want to fast track this as fast as possible. And then it goes into the good enough. So when are we done? And, and what is, is really cool here is that you you know that the scope is what you have, right? And good enough is that it actually works in a thin client with all the chattiness and latency and all that. Um, but that's really the good enough. That's when we are done. Cookbooks, uh, I, I just want to, uh, to point out here is that looking at the current code patterns, which are a little bit different from language to language, then we can actually do a cookbook that will engage a number of application programmers that can actually go in and, and go through the, uh, the code. Um, so that basically leads uh, into the next, uh, yeah, it's in, in, a, in a short while, the, the, the next topic here, because having uh, so many teams and having the the need to use all these different competences around. So whether it's you need somebody that knows how to build a thin client, or you need somebody to, to figure out what data, what's the scope of the data, uh, and all that stuff, basically means that you have, you have the need for so many different uh, uh, competences. But at the same time, you also want to, you know, to form the teams that uh, uh, can do these dedicated uh, tasks and, and and that's uh, the next uh, presentation. But before that, uh, I think we have uh, five minutes for a number of questions. <laughs>